Our first session is uh, going to be very inspiring. It's, in, it's in, entitled Selecting a Target in Cancer Therapeutics, Personalized Cancer Therapy. And our lead-off speaker is Bill Sellers from the Novartis Institutes of Biomedical Research. Bill is going to speak about targeting critical oncogenic pathways in cancer, emerging molecules, and translational strategies. I'd like to thank uh, Dan and Bruce for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so I want to begin uh, by framing the conversation around the paradigm that's been established by the treatment of chronic myelogenous leukemia with the matinib. And uh, I think it's fair to say that um, the diagnosis of CML previously was uh, generally uh, attributed to a, uh, a progression to accelerated blast crisis and eventually uh, to death prior to um, the advent of Gleevec. And we know that the paradigm that's been established here was to understand CML not as a cancer of the bloodstream, but really as a genetic disease driven by the fusion of the bcr able uh, oncogene created by the translocation of chromosomes 9 and 22. And based on the understanding of activation of the Abelson kinase, imatinib was elaborated as an able kinase inhibitor. And if one looks at the uh, incidence and then mortality rate since uh, 1997, one can see that uh, in 1997, 4,300 or 4,500 patients or so were diagnosed every year, and that remained unchanged over the last uh, 13 years. And in 1997, about 2,500 patients a year died of the disease. Imatinib was introduced in 2001. One can see, uh, not in a clinical trial, but instead just by looking at the statistics that are published by the Cancer Journal of Statistics every year, that the mortality rate of the disease fell from 2,500 a year to 450 a year. And you can see it appears that the mortality rate has stabilized at around 450 patients per year. But that's actually somewhat misleading because of the increased number of patients that are surviving, the prevalence of the disease has actually gone up quite dramatically. So the number of patients that are at risk to die every year is substantially higher now than it was in 1997, which means the mortality rate per patient prevalence is actually falling quite dramatically and continues to fall. So the, one of the questions, next slide please. Uh, that one can have is, is this paradigm generalizable or is somehow this just an abnormality of a CML, a idiosyncrasy of a, a simple genetic disease that happens to be in the bloodstream? Uh, and I like to show this particular uh, slide because it's the first patient that was treated who had a kit mutant melanoma. So this is a rare form of melanoma, first described by Boris Bastian that harbors activating mutations in the kit oncogene. And the first patient that was treated with Gleevec on this, uh, on a uh, phase two trial, uh, showed this response in which you can see the pretreatment PET CT scan followed by the post treatment PET CT scan. And I like this example because I think many people would have described melanoma as intrinsically refractory to therapy. In fact, you can probably go back in the literature and find all sorts of papers on why melanoma was intrinsically resistant to chemotherapy instead of why don't we understand the pathogenesis of melanoma and treat it based on a pathogenic understanding of the disease. And I think this illustrates that point quite clearly, but also emerging data with the Plexicon BRAF inhibitor also further emphasizes that a genetic understanding of a disease, including a disease as inherently refractory as melanoma, can lead us to improve therapeutics. Next slide. So I've created a list of those diseases in which um, I believe that there is a, a known genetic driver mutation and a therapy that is currently uh, approved or in clinical trials for that disease. And I think you can see this spans the uh, gamut from uh, hematologic malignancies to rare pediatric tumors such as cancers to lung cancer and, uh, and melanoma, again, an inherently refractory disease. So I think this paradigm, far from being sort of an isolated uh, example confined to CML, is really much more prevalent and uh, hopefully will continue to grow in its prevalence over time. So the question is, if we really think about the model of drug discovery or drug development that's been elaborated by this paradigm, which I show on the right, and contrast it to the model uh, that we've been operating on for some time, shown on the left, we can sort of see these uh, progressive uh, attempts to increase, uh, is, is there a pointer that actually that works? 
Yeah, I, I need a pointer if, if possible. So you can see under model A, what we've been trying to do is through a series of empirical experiments without really understanding the pathogenesis of the disease, we've been trying to add sequential forms of chemotherapy to a given unselected patient population and gradually improve the survival curve in this progressive uh, manner. Uh, whereas on, on panel B, we can see a model in which in which the genetic understanding of the disease, again illustrated here by kit mutant melanoma, might enable us to do much smaller focused clinical trials with much greater benefit to specific patients. Next slide. So if we're going to in implement plan B or shift from plan A to plan B, um, it's worth considering what the problems are that might block us from going from plan A to plan B in a more robust or, or faster manner. And the first one, of course, is in order to understand cancer from a genetic perspective, one would have to know all the genetic alterations in all of the cancers. And we still don't uh, know that, despite the advent of high-throughput sequencing. The genome projects that might really evaluate fully the genetic alterations in cancer are, are just really ramping up now. I think this is exemplified by the fact that an uh, oncogene known as ARID1A was discovered to be mutated in 40 percent of ovarian cancer just last, last week, suggesting we still have a ways to go before we know the major genetic alterations. So I'm not going to spend any more time on this, but I think it's worth considering that we need to finish this, um, and hopefully within five years we'll have that done. Now the second problem that's being uh, illuminated by the ongoing sequencing efforts are the fact that as we're sequencing more and more tumors, we're in fact finding out that we actually know most of the genetic alterations, or a lot of them. And this includes the finding that p53 mutation, every time we sequence a new tumor, is coming up as the most common genetic alteration in human cancer, something that we've known about for 20 years. And that illuminates this problem. Problem number two is that is most known genetic alterations have not led to drug candidates. Uh, and so this remains a fundamental block, and I'll spend just a few minutes on that. Next slide. So if we think about the types of genetic alterations, they really fall into two categories, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. And if we think about the oncogenes like BCR ABLE, where we've made progress in making drugs, we have to also consider the oncogenes like RAS, BCL2, MYC, and ERG and ETV1, where we've known about these genetic alterations for some time, but have, have not made any progress in directly inhibiting the function of those oncogenes. So how can we take on that problem? I think. This is an example that really was uh, um, demonstrated by Abbott, in which they elaborated ABT737, an inhibitor of the BCL2 oncogene. Uh, this was something like a 10-year effort to make an inhibitor of a protein-protein uh, interaction surface, an area that traditionally many uh, drug companies would have shied away from. Uh, but I think increasingly we need to take this type of risk to expand the druggable universe. And their lead candidate, ABT263, is currently in uh, phase tri two trials. Next slide. So oncogenes, we might uh, expand the universe of druggable oncogenes by taking on these difficult to drug targets like transcription factors, for example. But in the tumor suppressor field, it's even a more challenging problem because in the tumor suppressor field, we have the problem that the given alteration is actually missing. That is, the protein that's targeted by the genetic alteration generally is absent uh, or has a loss of function phenotype. So restoring normal signaling to a pathway that's disrupted by a tumor suppressor uh, protein has been uh, traditionally very difficult. But th even there, I think there's been some progress recently, and there's at least two ways we can think about this. The first is if we can identify a direct downstream dependent node in a tumor suppressor pathway, we may be able to reverse the transformation phenotype that's been set in progress by the tumor suppressor mutation. And this is uh, exemplified, uh, and I'll show you in the, the next slide, uh, by progress in targeting the hedgehog signaling pathway. And I'm going to use the hedgehog pathway in the rest of the talk as an illustration of both targeting a tumor suppressor pathway and also trying to understand resistance, which I'll talk about uh, a little later. So the hedgehog pathway begins with ligands binding to a receptor called patched, which is then a repressor of the smoothened receptor. Mutations in cancer, primarily in medulloblastoma and basal cell carcinoma, consist primarily of deletions or inactivating point mutations in the patched receptor, which lead to smoothened uh, 
activation and then downstream signaling through the Glee transcription factor family. And this led to the hypothesis first really proposed by Phil Beachy that pat patched mutant tumors would be dependent on smoothened activity. <clears throat> So at Novartis, we've been making a smoothened inhibitor known as LDE-225. It is now finishing phase one clinical trials. You can see it inhibits the downstream reporter glee luciferase activity with seven or 13 uh, nanomolar IC50s, but doesn't really inhibit uh, a control or wind signaling luciferase reporter. And if one then takes a, next slide, mouse model in which a tumor has been induced through mutations in the tumor suppressor patched, and we give increasing doses of LDE-225, you can see that, as shown in the blue line, we progressively, in a dose-dependent manner, inhibit Glee transcription. Uh, this is a very nice dose response, and uh, satisfyingly, it results in a dose-dependent inhibition and then regression uh, of tumors, suggesting that, in fact, at least in the mouse, patch-deficient medulloblastoma is, in fact, dependent on the smoothing receptor. In humans, we've been conducting the phase one clinical trials as well. This shows skin biopsies on patients at increasing doses, measuring the reporter uh, activity, the Glee transcription reporter, and you can see with increasing doses up to here, 1,500 milligrams per day, we're getting close to, uh, at 1,500, 100% 100 uh, target inhibition. Now, we've had a few patients uh, with medulloblastoma and basal cell carcinoma in the trial. This is a patient who had a cerebellar lesion, a 39-year-old male with refractory medulloblastoma who had been previously treated with radiation surgery, multiple chemotherapy regimens, autologous bone marrow transplant, and Avastin, uh, but had a dramatic response by cycle two on LDE-225. So I think this does suggest that in a tumor suppressor syndrome, if one identifies the uh, optimal node downstream in a tumor suppressor pathway, of course, that node would have to be then druggable. One can begin to target uh, through therapeutics tumor suppressor pathways as well. Another example of this, I'm going to skip this slide, next slide, is in the case of the PI3 kinase TOR pathway in which we've known for some time that deletions of the tuberous sclerosis complex lead to activation of TOR and activation of S6 kinase, and that in Drosophila, if you delete S6 or inhibit TOR, you can reverse the phenotype induced by deletions of the tuberous sclerosis complex. Next slide. <clears throat> in a proof of concept experiment that was done in Drosophila, uh, one can see that if one mutates the tuberous sclerosis gene, one gets a small a larval phenotype, as shown here, and that's reversible by inhibiting the immediate downstream target, the TOR uh, kinase, with, an, in this case, an allosteric uh, inhibitor of TOR known as RAD001. <clears throat> so this has led to a clinical trial of RAD001 in patients with tuberous sclerosis that harbor a rare form of brain tumor known as subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, an example of uh, which is shown here. Uh, patients at the University of Cincinnati uh, Hospital were treated with RAD at 5 or 10 milligrams per day, and 95% of the patients had uh, tumor volume reduction with a th response rate of 30%. No patients progressed on the trial, and just this last Friday, the FDA approved Ifinitor for patients with tuberous sclerosis that have this particular mutation. So I think this is a second example of a tumor suppressor syndrome caused by inactivation of of TSC1 and 2 complex, where an immediate downstream consequence is understood, it's druggable, and the uh, drug has uh, the appropriate effects in human clinical trials. Next slide. So the second way we can think about uh, tumor suppressor pathways and the undruggable oncogenes is this concept so known as synthetic lethality. Uh, if we don't have a druggable lesion right in the tumor suppressor pathway itself, we may have to find a lethal phenotype or a lethal node somewhere else uh, in the cell or in an alternative pathway. And many people have, uh, have uh, sort of called this concept synthetic lethality. It's really sort of a perversion of the yeast synthetic lethality in which two viable mutations when combined together create a lethal phenotype in the yeast. In cancer, we consider this a genetic mutation which, of course, creates a viable tumor, a drug which has a therapeutic index, but when we combine the mutation and the drug together, we get lethality of the tumor and hopefully uh, a therapeutic index in the host. Next slide. <clears throat> 
We've been conducting synthetic lethal screens using S pooled SHRNA, SHRNA technology in order to try to identify additional nodes in tumor suppressor and oncogene pathways using next-gen sequencing to deconvolute the results of these pools. Next slide. Here's an example in which several thousand genes were inactivated in a pooled screen by SHRNA, uh, in which those SHRNAs that inhibited the growth of BRAF mutant cells were identified by depletion. And you can see you identify not only BRAF, but the downstream dependence uh, of MEK1 and ERK2 in this particular example. Next slide. So um, next slide, please. So if we were to develop successful therapeutics targeting either oncogenes or tumor suppressors, as I've just described, we know that one drug is not going to satisfy uh, uh, us in terms of getting to the, uh, the curative therapy. And this is at least in part because we know that resistance will develop to targeted agents. Next slide. This was first exemplified by the work of um, uh, Charles Sawyers in characterizing BCR able mutations uh, in patients that were insensitive or relapsing to imatinib. He found a number of those mutations caused resistance to imatinib by disrupting the binding to imatinib. And we've been working on a second generation inhibitor to try to overcome some of those resistance mutations. In, in um, trying to defeat the resistance that's occurred to imatinib, we've generated a second generation uh, BCR able inhibitor known as nilotinib. And I just wanted to show you some of the characteristics between imatinib and nilotinib because I think it illustrates one really central feature of uh, targeted therapeutics. So if we look at imatinib and its ability to inhibit BCR able either in a, cel in a cellular autophosphorylation assay or proliferation assay, it's actually a modest inhibitor. By sort of normal kinase inhibitor standards, this would be considered sort of uh, weak, a 200 nanomolar inhibitor. It inhibits KIT with an IC50 of 108 nanomolar. It does not inhibit SARC, uh, level, SARC at kinase family members, and it has a plasma trough of about 260 nanomolar. Nilotinib really improved one feature of imatinib, namely the binding and inhibition of BCR able by about tenfold. So now it's a 20 nanomolar inhibitor of BCR able. It maintains about the same IC50 of C kit, doesn't really change SARC or other uh, kinase activities, and achieves nearly the same trough level. So, in, in some ways, the clinical experiment that's now been done is a direct uh, testing of the hypothesis if I make a better able inhibitor, do I get better efficacy? Instead of asking if I change the characteristics of the kinase profile, if I add additional inhibitory activities, so you know, what's the result of simply making a more potent able inhibitor in CML? And that was recently uh, answered, next slide, uh, in a randomized clinical trial of nilotinib versus imatinib in frontline CML. And these are the results. This is showing um, molecular response. Uh, measured uh, by uh, PCR, and you can see in the white bars, imatinib at 12 months achieves a 22 percent molecular response, major molecular response rate, whereas both arms of nilotinib nearly double that. More importantly, even though I showed you the death rate from um, CML has been dro dropping dramatically, on the next slide, you can see that if you look at the early emerging data from these trials in terms of progression to accelerated phase or blast crisis, on this treatment, uh, 12 patients in the imatinib arm progressed during the trial to blast crisis in both of the nilotin arms, which are, are each the same size of the, uh, as the uh, imatinib arm, only three patients progressed. So I think we can say that if you want to target an oncogene, you want to make the best, most selective potent inhibitor possible, uh, and that this will be um, one of the keys to trying to overcome resistance in the future. Now, next slide. Now, one of the things that we also learned from the treatment of CML with imatinib from the work of George Daly was that one could start to anticipate resistance mechanisms before you get to the clinic and start to make second generation inhibitors or more potent inhibitors before you've even understood the results of the first inhibitor. So we've taken that approach with LDE-225 and I want to show you some of the lessons we've learned about resistance to LDE-225 even though our clinical trials are just uh, sort of in mid, midstream. So I showed you this slide before, which uh, I cut off right about at day 16, which was the nicest part of the graph to show, which is where all the tumors had regressed. 
but much to the credit of their drug discovery team, they actually carried this study out to about 51 days. And even though I showed you that at 20 milligrams, we had a complete response rate that was better than at 5 and 10, what's clear is that the mouse tumors relapse very quickly on 20 milligrams, and there's a continued dose response out to 160 milligrams, though even at 160 milligrams, eight times the dose where we first see complete response, we get resistance. Uh, and so this says two things. One is it's almost impossible to tell what the optimal dose is. Uh, I've shown you three different dose response curves, the inhibition of luciferase as a PD marker, the inhibition of tumor growth in its initial response, and then the third dose response, the relapse after treatment. And the first two would have been consistent at 20 milligrams, but development of resistance seems to suggest that higher doses would have been better. At any rate, the observation that there was resistance in this genetically engineered mouse model gave us the opportunity to harvest those tumors and understand uh, the resistant phenotype, and we did that by comparing sensitive tumors and resistant tumors, both at the expression level, by DNA copy number analysis, and by sequencing. Uh, so the first thing we did is to look at the expression data to ask whether we could see pathways that were initially high or on in the uh, untreated case were inhibited during treatment and then re also turned back on during resistance. Uh, and you can see this pattern of high, low, high, as shown here also. And the top matching pathway, not surprisingly, was the hedgehog pathway. That is, the hedgehog pathway was on in the sensitive tumors, turned off during treatment, but turned back on during resistance. So, of course, one question is, what's the reason the pathway is being reactivated? Next slide. So, based on the imatinib experience, the first thing one might surmise is that there were mutations in smoothened that were disrupting the binding of our inhibitor to the receptor. So, we sequenced 138 resistant tumors for the um, extracellular domain of the smoothened receptor, but in those 138, we only found uh, six or seven mutations uh, in these tumors that could confer resistance at the molecular level uh, to smoothen. So while genetic alterations in the receptor can occur, they weren't clearly the dominant uh, form of resistance, at least in this particular case. So the next thing we did is look at genetic alterations at the chromosomal level by uh, CGH arrays. And in this case, in a significant number of tumors, we found amplification at, of a focal amplicon uh, that turned out to amplify GLE2, the downstream transcription factor that I showed you was at the bottom of the pathway. Next slide. To further characterize this, we looked at GLE1, GLE2, and GLE3 by quantitative PCR at the DNA level to look at copy number abnormalities in those three genes. And you can see about half the tumors increase the level of GLE2 copy number, but don't change GLE1 and GLE3. So about 50% of the tumors can be accounted for by uh, GLE2 amplification, and we don't know what the rest of the tumors are doing in order to activate the, um, the pathway. Now, the problem with GLE2 amplification, of course, is it's a transcription factor, and it falls back into the category of uh, targets that are no longer druggable. So we thought, well, perhaps there would be a pathway that is cooperating with the hedgehog pathway during resistance that might have a druggable target. And so we went back to the expression data and looked for a different pattern of expression where we might look for a pathway that was off initially in the untreated tumors, off during treatment, but then only turned on during resistance. And uh, when we looked at the expression profiles for, for that particular target, next slide, uh, you can see now you have a off, off, on pattern. That's, of course, the pattern we were looking for. And when we subjected the genes that are ranked by this pattern to a, a, a form of analysis known as gene set enrichment analysis, then uh, we scored a number of pathways. Uh, you can see here IGF-1R, PIP3, AKT, bad phosphorylation, those pathways all having in common the fact that they represent uh, signaling through the PI3 kinase pathway. Next slide. So this suggested that in cooperation with hedgehog reactivation, PI3 kinase signaling might be playing a cooperative role in mediating resistance. And that led us to try one of our uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors, an inhibitor known as BEZ235, in combination with LDE225. And you can see a significant attenuation in the resistance uh, in this combination. Next. So the third problem that I mentioned to implementing this plan B was that resistance develops the targeted agents. But that, of course, gives us the opportunity now on the, tar on the targeted therapeutic 
uh, paradigm of understanding resistance at an early stage and trying to develop novel combinations uh, at a much earlier stage than um, after the drug is already on the market. Now this also, of course, uh, basically leads us to the conclusion that one drug will never be enough, and I think we've known that for many years of trying to treat uh, cancer patients, um, that we're going to have to use combinations. And the question is, how are we going to find the right combinations? So I want to go, next slide, to back to this model. Right now, our model of finding combinations is to take some new drug, add it to a bunch of old drugs, and hope that we get something like this plus the new agent on top of something like cisplatinum and gemcitabine and hope for a 10-year you know, history of progressively elevating that uh, curve. But what I hope for, and whether this is true or not, I don't know, is again, plan B. That is, we will find novel combinations that have much more dramatic activity than we expected, perhaps that we can find in, in small phase two trials, and then we can focus our efforts on those novel uh, combinations potentially uh, changing the therapeutic paradigm for that particular type of cancer. Next. And I think the work of Jeff Engelman and Lou, uh, I, Jeff will probably talk about this, was illustrative of this, so I, I won't go over that, but Jeff and Lou basically found that if you combine PI3 kinase and MEK inhibitors to interrupt both of these pathways, you got significant therapeutic efficacy, efficacy combined to just the single agent therapy. Ne next. Given the time, I'm going to uh, skip this slide. So in terms of these combinations, that Jeff's work was an example of a hypothesis-directed combination. We can also imagine uh, on the next uh, a large-scale combination screen is something we're undertaking with a company called Combinatorics next to try to test all of the relevant compounds across all of the relevant compounds uh, across a hundred representative cancer cell lines next in a, a screen that's going to result in the testing of nine million combination triads. So this would be one way to try to find special combinations uh, through a preclinical screening effort. Next. Let's go to the next slide. So the final problem that we've had in drug discovery is uh, illustrated in the next point. That is, we've never uh, been able to really preclinically characterize next the um, uh, or predict clinical efficacy based on a rational preclinical uh, set of experiments. And this is largely because we haven't had a translational infrastructure in which to do this. Next slide. Uh, in any case, I think um, we've lacked two aspects of uh, the translational infrastructure. One is a set of models that are well characterized and reflective of the disease we're trying to treat. Uh, and then the second is a capacity to screen those models in enough detail that we would have a, a be able to build predictive uh, understanding of whether a given new therapeutic will have activity in a given set of patients. So in addition to the cell line models, we've also been building a primary human tumor model collection. It's now totals 291 uh, primary human tumors that are grown only in mice. The distribution of the tumors are shown here. These are also being characterized at the genetic level to allow us to now use uh, tumors that perhaps are not conditioned to growing on plastic dishes. Next. So I want to go back to this, um, this paradigm and, and just summarize the five points I've made and try to, uh, again, reinforce potential solutions to those five problems that I've articulated. Next. First, we need to complete the cancer genome and death to address this lack of understanding of the genetic alterations of cancer. Next. <coughs> We need to work on validated difficult-to-drug targets like RAS and MYC that we've, uh, we know are important drivers, but we have been unable to target. Discover synthetic lethal drug targets e either for undruggable oncogenes or for the tumor suppressor lesions. Study resistance preclinically and come up with combinations that address that or new inhibitors. Next. Discover no no novel highly active combinations, test them early in development, not necessarily in combination with existing therapeutics, and find those combinations that are highly active and more likely to lead to a transformational benefit to patients. Next. And then finally, uh, build a robust preclinical and translational infrastructure to allow us to make better predictions uh, for uh, the clinical trials going forward. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll uh, wrap up and thank many of the patients that have been um, participating in our clinical trials. And I have the great pleasure to work with a lot of uh, great scientists at Novartis and in our academic community and been very happy to, to be here and happy to address questions. <laughs>
So we have time for a few questions. Let me, let me just go to the microphone. this on? Yeah. Let me start with just a philosophical question about how optimistic you are. About a couple of years ago, people would have argued that maybe 10% of all cancers have a single gene defect or a targetable gene defect, and drug companies are going to be making more and more drugs against the same targets. When Novartis now looks at the next five years, how, where do you set the bar? How, what frequency or what fraction of cancers you think will be benefiting from targeted agents? Yeah, so that's sort of an, a noble. Of course, if we made if we made a RAS inhibitor, it would be 90% of pancreas cancer, right? So, I think I flipped the question around the other way. What proportion of cancers are driven by driver mutations? And I think all of them. What proportion can we drug today? It's a minority. What proportion can we drug in the future, either by inventing new mechanisms of uh, of uh, therapeutic inhibition, such as siRNA or protein protein interactions? Um, I, I think it's going to be high. So uh, uh, I'm, of course, the ever, ever optimist, but uh, I think we're on the right track. Uh, in terms of the fraction of patients we care about, it's uh, one of our models is that even if at first ALK would be a perfect example of this, uh, the ALK mutations in lung cancer, which were first only known in neuroblastoma, which was a orphan small disease, you know, had someone said, I'm going to work on ALK and neuroblastoma, you'd be well positioned uh, to work on ALK and lung cancer. So that's our philosophy also. It's more about do we understand the pathogenesis of that particular target in that disease with the hope or expectation that it might be much larger uh, later on. And sometimes it won't be, sometimes it will be. Bruce? from the lotnib. It also, as I understand it, has activity against some of the, the, maybe the weaker mutations that lead to resistance. The other problem with potency is that you often see an increase in the toxicity when you increase potency in terms of the dose that you can give. So overall, do you think nalotinib succeeded because of its increased potency or because it was able to overcome certain uh, mutations that confer resistance? Well, I think in many cases, you're not, you're probably, in the case of early treatment in CML, you're probably preventing the resistance from developing in the first place. Of course, in second line therapy, it had to work in resistant mutations. But I want to go to your therapeutic index question. Um, ABLE turns out to be fairly unique. That is, you can inhibit ABLE as much as we can possibly inhibit it, and it seems to have no consequence on the adult organism. This is not true for almost everything else. So for PI3 kinase, we get hyperglycemia. For the smoothened inhibitor, we actually think we have a really good inhibitor because we're seeing muscle cramps and uh, CPK elevations, which we think is an on-target effect of inhibiting smoothened. So the better we make the drug, the more on-target will our dose-limiting toxicity be. Now the problem I see is we get to the dose-limiting toxicity, which we're saying is 100% target inhibition or our best measure of target inhibition, and then we reduce the dose. Okay, so that if we had done that in the chemotherapy er regimen error, we would have cut the dose of cyclophosphamide in half, cut the dose of adriamycin in half. We would have practiced this dose reduction in a way that would have been detrimental to the ultimate cure of some of the tumors that were cured by chemotherapy. So I think when we have dose limiting toxicity that's on target, we do need to start thinking about the paradigm of mitigating the toxicity by second, second drugs, so metformin for hyperglycemia or insulin. We have to start changing the scheduling so that we can have potent inhibition for a period of time and then a recovery period. And in fact, I would say that imatinib, Gleevec, has done some damage to that uh, paradigm in that now everybody thinks we should just give the drug every day and no one's going to have any toxicity, and, and that's the paradigm. I think it's actually quite different, especially when we go to combinations. It's going to be back to intensive therapy with holidays, and we need to start doing more of that. Thank you. I can hear you. <laughs> so considering the ever-present criticism that cell lines do not really represent primary tumors, have you compared in detail your xenografts to establish the cell lines, and did you actually uh, get any benefit from using xenografts or cell lines or screens or, or uh, Yeah, so I, I try not to make ver very strict, uh, you know, it's going to work for this. Uh, and then if it doesn't work for everything, we're going to abandon it. So cell lines are very good, of course, for cell autonomous genetic driven Events. So, you know, you have ALK mutation in lung cancer, ALK mutant cell lines are highly reflective. 
If you have pathways like WINT signaling and hedgehog signaling and mo more of the development pathways, which are often a paracrine, they are of no use in cell lines. And in fact, in our primary models, hedgehog signaling is a robust player in the pancreas tumors, for example, that grow in the mouse. Even then, of course, it's not ideal because we have mouse stroma growing, uh, supporting human cancer. And we know a number of examples already where receptors and ligands don't cross mix. And so I think that's where gems are going to come very useful, where you can study uh, gem models of human cancer in their normal stromal environment. Uh, so I think all three of those are the sort of foundation, and we use them as needed to uh, you know, address certain types of therapeutic questions.